Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. And joining us today is Deirdre McCloskey. She's Emerita Distinguished Professor of Economics and of History and Professor of English and Communications at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She's the author of many books, most recently Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas, Not Capital or Institutions, Enriched the World. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So with this last book, Bourgeois Quality, you've reached the end of your Bourgeois Era trilogy. Yes. Um, and these are these are three big Praise books. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> the, these three books, big books, I mean to say they cover a lot of ground would I think be to understate the matter <laughs> a bit. Um, for our audience who has not waded into all three or even one of them yet, can you give us a thumbnail sketch? Sure. The three are a defense of – what is unfortunately called capitalism and it's a full bore defense. It's not just economic <clears throat> although I think you can make a very good economic case in favor of capitalism but it's social and political as well. And the k kinds of evidence that, that I use range from quantitative economic calculations right through um, Shakespeare and Jane Austen. <laughs> That's clearly a gamut. I'm just trying to say that clearly I know what goes in between those two things. Is that is in the middle of it? Is that like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Does that, is that on that continuum? Exactly. So what are you trying to explain in these Well, books? I'm trying to explain modern economic growth, the most important secular event in human history is that in 1800, the average person on the planet earned in modern Washington, D.C. Uh, prices – Three dollars a day, earned and spent three dollars a day, and now the average American earns and spends one hundred and thirty dollars a day in the same prices. What's so the world average? Do you know? The world average is thirty three. It's about the same as as Brazil's income per head. So think of Brazil as the average. Um, China is about twenty dollars a day. India about ten. So, and this is just an immense improvement. And, and it's the central um, question as, as the blessed Adam Smith said, the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. What does it mean to say that someone lives on $3 a day versus $33 a day? 130 because, for Americans. Uh, or say 33 for the world average. Yeah, but so when we're talking about how the world for most of its history lived on $3 a day, that means that they were in, on an average day, they – purchased what we – an amount of stuff equaled what we today could buy for $3? That's right. And so, so it allows for inflation. OK. It allows for exchange rates. I mean these, these figures are very rough, I, I, of course. But the order of magnitude is not in doubt and there's no economic historian who will contradict the rough order of magnitude involved. It's an amazing change and there is nothing like it in the um, – Glory of Greece and grandeur of Rome and Song China and the Italian uh, Renaissance. There, there. You, you might get a doubling, but this isn't a doubling. <laughs> this is a factor of thirty, twenty nine hundred percent. That so that fact has been. People have tried to explain this before. I mean, you said yeah. economists are aware of this yeah, fact. Yeah, it's, it's, well, a, it's a hockey stick, as you it's as you say. It's a hockey stick, and that fact is. I mean, as you said, even Adam Smith thought that this was an interesting question of why are nations wealthy? Although I must say the sharp awareness of the hockey stick, the amazing – the blade of the hockey stick shooting up, that's rather recent. That's in the last say half century or so that people have really seen, oh my god, it's that high. Yeah, so it's a thing my, my dad once pointed out to me that if you were to take a time machine from – maybe 1000 BC, if you were an average person living in 1000 sure. BC and you took a time machine to 1400 AD yeah. in say England, it's pretty um, much the you, same. Would, you would not have that much. You would not be shocked. To, I mean, mean maybe some the fashions, would look, fashions would look different but it's still toil is the yeah, name of the right. game. Exactly. Most and, people and can't read and – Early death, um, unable to read, uh, uh, eating a very um, – Narrow and un unhealthy diet. Uh, housing is terrible. Uh, it's a hut with a hole in the roof for the smoke. 
worldwide, mm-hmm. everywhere. And and then there's a tiny group of kings and, and, and so on, priests, who might live better than that. But even um, Louis XIV, the sun king in Versailles in 1700, you know, he, he was subject to smallpox when he rode around in his carriage. It was bumpy. <laughs> um, the, and, and people who waited on him in the Great Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, there were no bathrooms. There were no bathrooms in Versailles. So if you had to heed the call of nature, you went out into the, into the stairs and peed. Now the king didn't do that. Though. The king didn't do that. He had a special place where he would pee with all his dukes around him to help him pee. So that was his great wealth difference between – That's <laughs> – in fact, yes. In fact, there's it, – it, it, there's been an awful lot of talk about inequality recently and it's it, – it's, I think it's deeply foolish because the real inequality was in 1800 and before. Um, rich people in the 18th century in Europe would have orangeries, that is, in their backyard. They had a backyard. They'd have orange trees and lemon trees and so on. And so they didn't get scurvy. Whereas if you were a poor person subsisting on black bread, you could get scurvy because you weren't getting enough vitamin C. So this growth then, you – over the trilogy, you're giving your argument for yeah. why and how this happened. Um, which is a – it's a subtle and really interesting argument and cause. But it's this – you're not the first to tackle this question. No, to put yeah. it mildly. As I said, back to Adam Smith and, and Marx and and all, all – Schumpeter, all the great uh, economists and historians have faced this question. So then prior to – Deirdre McCluskey coming on the scene. Uh, yes. What What are the stories that are typically given or most accepted for well, the cause? Well, there are two. There's, there's one on the left, which is Marx and, and others, which is that uh, the great enrichment, as I call it, of the 19th century was caused by exploitation. The slave trade, for example, which has become popular again among young historians um, or – simply um, exploitation of the workers, you then take the so-called surplus value and you invest it in machines and that causes the modern world. So that's that's the left side. On the right, it's about um, virtuous capital accumulation. You abstain from consumption as we economists say and then use that money to invest in ports and, and – uh, uh, carriages and houses and, and machines. They both – both of these explanations depend in a sense on the word, very word capitalism, which as I said earlier is a not a very good word describing what, what the history of the last two centuries has been. The, the, the problem is that sheer piling of bricks on bricks or even – University bachelor's degrees and university bachelor's degrees reaches diminishing returns very quickly. You can you can build a factory and then you can build another one next door and then hey let's do a third one and a fourth one. You can see that this is not going to work out. Well, you don't get the exponential. You, get you don't diminishing. get the exponential. What you do is you get declining returns on the next brick. And it declines and declines and declines. Um, John May- Maynard Keynes pointed out that without innovation, you could drive the interest rate down to zero um, in a generation or two. So it can't be just accumulation. And in any case, humans have always accumulated. I mean, they uh, accumulated Oshulian hand axes by the hundreds when they were in the caves and and the Chinese built the uh, Great Wall and then built the Grand Canal and and so on. So in investment, whether it comes from exploiting the poor or from um, virtuous savings, is can't be the key. What has to be the key is innovations. I call them market-tested uh, betterments. That is – an idea like 
the railway, which um, is a combination of rails that they used in coal mines to move the the uh, carts with coal in them to the to the head of the mine with a high pressure steam engine, not the great big slow things, atmospheric engines, but high pressure. And you combine those two, and suddenly you have have railways and. <clears throat> There's been this just this amazing burst of innovation since 1800. And my explanation is not this capital accumulation idea or even institutional change. But my idea is that there was an ideological change and that people started admiring market-tested innovation or indeed admiring markets much more than they had before. And that made everyone bold. It made the ordinary person think, gee, I can invent a cherry core. <laughs> I'm a orchardman in Wisconsin in the 19th century with a lot of time on my hands in the winter. And I can invent still another cherry core taking the – not core, uh, uh, pitter, taking the pit out of the cherry. And so you get this just amazing – screw propellers, the band saw, the electric motor, the, the internal combustion engine, blah, 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 blah. So a merchant in – I mean I, I'll choose a time and you can correct me but let's say 1250 yeah. um, is not respected or – or, or it, and is it – is it they're not – and also an inventor – is yeah. also not respected unless they're doing maybe inventing a new stirrup for the horse for the charge right. or exactly. for the longbow. Exactly. For um, military innovations were admired. The, the very word innovation, as you can see if you look at the, uh, the history of the word in the Oxford English, Oxford English Dictionary, is a bad word until the 1800s. Uh, in the in the 1700s and bef before, oh, no, geez, let's not innovate. God, that would change things. It would disturb the, the gr great chain of being from king to family dog. No, no, we can't do this. And it only becomes a positive word. We all think that innovation is grand. No one in the last – hundred years have thought that innovation is a bad idea, although actually some of our friends on the left <laughs> are think, starting to think that. Well, they've, they've, <laughs> they've actually often, always yeah. thought that, that um, me mechanization causes unemployment, which it doesn't. Is there a difference between thinking innovation as a general concept or as something that happens in the abstract is good or bad versus – how you respond to on the ground individual innovations? Yeah. Because I'm thinking, like, to mention our friends on the left, like they, in general, if you ask yeah, young people on the left, like, yeah, innovation yeah, sure. is great, but then, good. but then when there's on the ground, like, well, we're going to replace taxi cabs with Uber, yeah, well, no, that that's it. bad. And in and in Germany, they've outlawed Uber. Yeah, the the problem is protectionism. And you can call it lots of names. You can call it mer mercantilism. You can call it – don't do it in my backyard. <laughs> Nimbyism, yes. You, you can call it all kinds of things and it's the impulse to protect John from the competition of, of Janus. And uh, in fact, um, American progressivism – a hundred years ago did predict John from Janus, made it much harder for women to be employed and that was on purpose. It was to protect middle-aged white males, Native Americans against the, against the, the women and the immigrants and the blacks and the young people who might compete against them. So – that's been one – as you point out, it's kind of a, um, a tension on the left because the left – I mean Marx was a great um, – had a great vision of improvement, 
of innovation. He, he believed that that the bourgeoisie and capitalism, as he called it, were were the great um, were these great improving forces in history, and then that socialism would be plucked as the ripe fruit from this uh, capitalist society. But his his followers um, have gone back to a much earlier version of economic thinking, namely protect, protect, protect. And, and the, the way I explain it to my students um, is I say, look, OK, you want to be protected against Mexico? Why don't we protect Chicago against the rest of the world? Why don't we protect the South Loop against the rest of the world? Indeed, why don't we protect my house against the rest of the world and I'll make all my own stuff and I'll be fully employed? And then they can kind of see that this is a crazy vision of the future. So I want to try and connect these two ideas because I'm still still trying to figure out – and I think these are connected. So merchants and businessmen and, and it's an equality of a certain type, middle yeah. class, the bourgeois and the, yeah, bourgeois, the bourgeois. In, Middle Ages have yeah. a different level of esteem, if no esteem at all, yeah, and innovation no has little esteem. But your contention is, is that it, it's not that people started inventing and then got esteem, yeah, it, or becoming merchants and then got esteem by bringing more wealth. It's that they first got esteem and then started bringing, yes. it, or was it more contemporaneous yes. than that? No, it, it's they first got esteem and then they they did well. And the, but of course, of course, there's some feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, um, you, you, you can see this in the talk in the early 18th century in England where merchants are rising in prestige. It's perfectly plain. And one of the arguments is precisely that the – and I see it's, it's a kind of mercantilist argument. It's a kind of protectionist military type argument that the, that the profits and the prosperity coming from the merchants makes England and then Britain stronger uh, in every way. And so th there is feedback. Th look, if this what I call bourgeois revaluation hadn't happened um, – or no, I'm, I'm, if, if 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 it hadn't resulted in economic success in this explosion of income in the 19th century, we would not be talking about how wonderful it is. In fact, then it took quite a while into the 19th century for trade-tested betterment to massively pay off for the working class. Is the origin of socialism? So the, the the protectionism thing I wanted to like try and tie this because yeah. one thing that I thought when I when I read was reading your first volume years ago was an idea that I had about that one of the most important things that had to happen for markets to be to thrive was mm -hmm. that you had to believe that certain types of harms were not actionable That's right. or morally wrong. So competitive That's exactly competitive right. harms. I mean this is clearly a harm. You run a butcher, Absolutely. someone comes in and starts a butcher, puts you out of business, maybe puts your family on the well, street. I, I publish a book and I hope that Bob Gordon's book does worse. Yeah. So but <laughs> but but we think that that's it's like it's it's all in the game. It's some yeah. it's something like this that's sort right. of thing. And, and that's a really important idea. John Stuart Mill is very explicit on this. In on liberty, he says in a sentence which I can't exactly re reproduce the the state should not take an interest in complaints of people against competitors unless the competitors are using force or fraud. Then the cr criminal law and the laws of, of contract and property should be brought to bear. But aside from that, if, you, if someone builds a better mousetrap and you're in the mousetrap industry and you don't get it, too bad for you. And it's, it's, it's a massive change to have that ethic. Well, that's why I, th I think there's always this tension. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's the, the and I, I mean, it's, we always have to talk about Trump in this day and age, but most 
competition is tough and very unforgiving. Yeah. And a lot of government has done a lot of things throughout history to just protect people from competition. Yeah, absolutely. But before we even understood, you know, that was the the way I kind of the very broad view. The only thing government was for in the mercantilist just to protect people exactly. from competition. That's exactly to foster right. markets, you need to get people to start thinking that competitive harms are not more actionable That's exactly in, in right. that way. So that, it's Indeed, it's, it, it would be interesting and I don't know this enough. I don't know the history of the common law well enough. I believe that the common law has never viewed competition of that character as actionable. Yeah, it had to be unfair. I mean right from the beginning. It had to be um, violence or, uh, uh, or, or fraud of some sort. Is even this change – Part of this change in the respect we paid to the middle class, to yeah. the merchants, because I can see, like, thinking about the way that we talk about competitive harm yeah. today, it seems like when the person who are, you are in competition with mm -hmm. and who is harming you is someone that you respect, yeah. that you you believe in the dignity of, then we seem to think it's it's okay. Yeah. Whether that's like. The, well, the merchant right. down the street or the other sports team and we've got the good sportsmanship. Right. As, as long as it's not the Jets. It's but fine. When, <laughs> yes. This, this is Aaron's an inveterate hatred for – and the Yankees. Yes, I'm down with that. <laughs> but, but when it's – it seems to switch over to that, that same sort of competitive harm becomes wrong, impermissible, yeah. immoral when it's done by someone we don't yeah. respect well, like, like Trump's that's Mexicans right. that's and Chinese. Yeah. That's exactly what I say in this new, new book. I speak of – the two, the the two equalities, I the 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 book is called Bourgeois Equality, which is a somewhat surprising title for for a, a free market person to use. But what I mean by bourgeois equality is equality of equality before the law. That's essential, but it's not sufficient, because exactly as you say. You need equality of social dignity or else the equality before the law is eroded. The history of European Judaism is a case in point where in the 18th and 19th centuries in all the countries of Western Europe at least, Jews get equality before the law. But they don't in most countries get equality of – dignity. This is the point that Hannah Arendt makes. And so you see the result. The equality before the law was, was um, abandoned in the 1930s in lots of countries. Well, that's super interesting because what comes from that seems to be – because Jews created – so many institutions of economic cooperation because yeah. they had a deficit yeah. in dignity even if they were on par That's right. well, in the they, law. You know, for very good reasons, they were nervous about their Christian uh, neighbors. Interestingly, as we've come to know, their, the, their neighbors in the Islamic world were lot, much less hostile to the Jews than were the, 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 than were the Christians. But, but the key is equality. And to use another somewhat surprising word, the key idea that is very radical in the 17th century, somewhat radical in the 18th century and becomes less and less so in the 19th and 20th century is liberalism. The, in, in the sense of – not in the modern American sense but in the, in the root sense and in the sense it's still used in most of the world, namely worthy of a free person – a free person is equal before the law and is equal in dignity. And this, this, kind, this kind of equality, not equality of result, which I call French equality in honor <laughs> of, uh, of uh, Rousseau and, and uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Piketty, um, not French equality of outcome, uh, end state e e equality as it's been called, but – Equality of, equality of opportunity. So then the structure of this argument though, let me ask about this because so you've – it's a trilogy of books and the, the story that you're trying to tell as you describe to us is 
why this economic growth happened and yeah. that it happened as a result of a rhetorical shift and an, a shift in the yes, way. Yes, a shift but, in ethics and ideology and rhetoric. But then the first volume of the trilogy yeah. is how does it then fit into the argument? Because it, in well, that one, you're re, you are reviving an ethical tradition and yeah. explaining it. So what what is that ethical tradition and why is – that step necessary to then books two and three. Well, I, I, I think it's necessary. Although you know, when you uh, write a book over ten years, a series of books, and you're thinking about them for twenty years, as I have been, your 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 ideas are bound to shift. At least I hope so, because you should be learning stuff as you as you go. And in the first book, I was simply trying to establish that there are commercial versions of the traditional virtues that you can attribute to modern market-tested market -tested betterment as I eventually came to call it or to capitalism. So I was trying to show that the sneering at the bourgeoisie, which is so common, it's, it's just reflexive in most people in the West and the East for that matter. Um, is his, uh, his, uh, his big mistake and that we should honor innovators and merchants and p people buying low and selling high. So it was part of the continuing th sub-theme of the th all three books which is against socialism, against, um, well, uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi is in many ways a wonderful man, said um, – that uh, to buy low and sell high is the worst possible thing that you could do. And this is crazy because buying ideas low and selling them high is how the economy innovates. Uh, if, if we're not going to make a profit, um, a profit that is then eroded by entry of the sort that John Stuart Mill said you couldn't – wasn't actionable <laughs> – then uh, if you don't have that, you don't have any progress at all and you stay at one, two or three dollars a day, which is essentially what Gandhi wanted. Now, how does this, this relationship work with political institutions do you, in the sense of do you see it – do you well, see it as a – as at first we have – we have to have relative freedom, I would yeah, say, for merchants crucial. to even – if, you, if it was illegal to be a merchant, it would be very hard to get people to start respecting merchants. That's right. That's right. If it, and if, 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 the, if the state is constantly intervening in the economy in various ways, it's not going to work out. So that – was that there, – were there certain places where there was a fertile yes. political environment for yes. this to happen? Well, for example, the, the, the first place in northern Europe where it happened on a big scale was in Holland. And this happens in the, in, in the 16th and, and 17th century. By the end of the 17th century, the English are so tired of fighting the Dutch as they did three times and, and being outsmarted by them in trade many times. They finally become Dutch practically. <laughs> the English do. They get a Dutch king. Well, they get a Dutch king, yes. They get a Dutch king. They adopt a, a, a Dutch stock market. They adopt a Dutch national debt. They, my only surprise is that they didn't adopt the Dutch language. But – that's when England starts becoming bourgeois. hundred years before in, in Shakespeare's time, everyone is against the bourgeoisie, against um, buying low and selling high, against innovation, against trade, against – trade is th thievery. And, and it shows in, in Shakespeare's plays, none of which even the Merchant of Venice uh, praises commerce. And so the the Dutch, the, is there? Would you do you try to go back further than that in the sense of, and at some point you, you know, how well you can bring an explanation back, like why Holland, like what was happening? Yeah. Was it the Hanseatic League had been there in the Middle Ages, yeah, so they, they, they trading was a part of their they, was it more part of their blood well, than indeed, other places. There's certainly the Hansa, and then there's um, uh, um, there, there's no, Northern Italy with its uh, its merchant. Republics, which, except for for Venice, gradually became non-republics, and there's Barcelona, a town I know and love, 
um, which has, an, has a long history in the, in the 12th and 13th century of a, a merchant town, a town that's, that's into this. But the, the scale of, of the low countries, not, not just what's now called Holland but also Belgium, and then the scale of England taking this over and Scotland then eventually and then the, the English American colonies taking over this liberal idea that any person should be equal before the law. Now, now don't get too excited about this because these are – in the, what became the United States, this is a slaveholding society. Uh, the, the man who wrote um, All Men Are Created Equal enslaved his own son – uh, by Sally Hemming. So, so it's not, not altogether – it's not complete equality. And indeed, the, the notion of equality that, that's born in um, full political form among, say, the, 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 among, say, say the levelers in the English uh, Revolution or Civil War of the 1640s, is one that keeps being expanded in the West. And now we have <laughs> equality for transgendered people. I mean, I, I never thought I'd see such a thing. And um, gay marriage and uh, women's li li liberation and um, the li liberation of colonial people and on and on and on. Are there historical examples where these things don't? go together where we have the liberalism without the respect for the middle class or the other way around? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't define a society that doesn't have r respect for commoners. It's not just the bourgeoisie. It's all commoners because how are you going to refresh the middle class, the merchant's class or the inventor's class? if not from the working class. So you, you have to – all people have to be empowered. All people have to be – in the English phrase, be allowed to have a go. Um, so so I, I, I wouldn't call a society that doesn't empower people that way a li, li, liberal society. For example, we think highly of Athens and, and I do too. Uh, there are lots of people who have this odd affection for Sparta and I really don't get that. <laughs> that is the status but, of the uh, ultimate uh, state of society. Yes. I know. They, they love Sparta. They think, boy, that's a grand idea when we're, we're – everyone's – They haven't had to eat their food. <laughs> well, it, I mean everyone's a surf, even the Spartanate. Or, kill, even, or even the, kill their babies. <laughs> even the free warriors are confined. Anyway, that's not Athens up the coast. Yet Athens was a slave society. Yet w w women were absolutely unfree. Yet if you were a foreigner, you couldn't vote. Yet, yet, yet. So that wasn't a liberal society. It was a commercial society. There's no question about it. What made Athens strong was its commerce. Uh, so um, you, you can have commercial success – and not get all the way to this modern idea. There is a great statement by um, R Rumbolt, a, a, a leveler who was hung by James II, I believe, in the, um, in the 1680s. As he was facing the hangman, he said, I think there is no man and, and also no woman, dear, who is born – uh, superior to another for none comes into the world with a saddle on his back and none comes booted and spurred to ride him. And that radical idea that every human is equal, not, not equal again in the French way but equal in, 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 in dignity and before the law is uh, – it took a long time to come on the scene and that's what made us rich. So the, the, to recapitulate then, the, 
the flow chart yeah. as you see it. I mean, it, 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 some yeah. things are pretty contemporaneous with understanding no, their the feedback chart, loops. Yeah, that's how I think is flow charts. So the flow chart uh, begins with what would be the first? So th- how do you get to the great enrichment? It, be- well, it begins with what? Does it here, begin here, with dignity or? Here's what I claim. And this is a little unsatisfactory, but it has the misfortune of being correct, so I have to say it, which is that there were accidents of European politics from the Reformation on that accidentally made people think that they could have a go. Let's take the Reformation itself, 1517. Martin Martin Luther and all that. It's not so much his reformation as what's known as the radical reformation. The Anabaptists eventually in England the next century, the uh, Quakers or the Congregationalists, the Puritans. What about Calvinists too? Calvinists but only if they were uh, uh, the Congregationalists. That is if they believed that – the congregation should choose the minister, mm-hmm. not some hierarchy. It's some that, of these are very eschatological. You're talking about this at line. They, they are the indeed. Anabaptists are indeed. unbelievably. They are indeed. Is. That's why it's it's Cromwell who invites the Jews back into England, who had been expelled in the 13th uh, um, century, um, because he believes that England is the new Jerusalem, and this this resounds down to this day in, in the, the the affection of radical Protestants for Israel. But in any case, um, the uh, this matter – it's not what Max Weber said, which was the, the, the doctrine of salvation changed. That's not, that's not my argument and I think it's his argument's wrong and has been shown to be wrong over and over again since it was written – in 1905. But what's really going on is church governance makes people feel empowered. When it, when it becomes more democratized. More democratized. For, and the extreme example again is, is, is English Quakers in which women and men were equal in the meeting. And there was no minister at all. And they just sat around and waited for the Holy Spirit to – As friends, yes. To, to <laughs> descend on them. Yeah, as friends. And yeah, the, the, the very phrase, the society of friends is, is crucial here. And that kind of equality is what made the modern world. And no surprise, an astonishingly high percentage of Quakers excluded from Oxford and Cambridge. So there were certain occupations they couldn't go into. But astonishingly high percentage of English Quakers, an extremely small group, were successful in, in business. Cadbury's chocolate, Roundtree's chocolate, just to be, be, begin with, were Quaker enterprises. So we had this increasing respect for – Merchants and the people who were innovating. Well, actually, I want to, because I want to clarify, because actually that's the the question. You, um, is I just try to is that the domino? I mean, if you're saying that's like the, the, the is that's before that's the, well mer, before, the merchant respect, well before the great enrichment, which is really the 19th so, century. So would it be that would the first domino be like? The printing press leading to yes. – leading to I, church I, reformation, I, leading I, to I, equality. I speak of the four R's: reading. Reformation, revolt, by which I mean specifically the Dutch revolt against Spain, 80 years, which ended in 1648, and revolution, the uh, English Civil War slash revolution of the 1640s, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. All of those could have gone the other way very easily. If uh, Ch- Charles I and Archbishop Laud had been um, uh, not such jerks, the English Revolution wouldn't have happened. All, it added to that um, 1688, the so-called Glorious Revolution when, as I said before, English England became Dutch. Add all those together and you have 
accidental, contingent events that came out in a way that made people bold. And what the the historical job here, to, to or the scientific job, is to then compare Europe after 1517 with other societies at the time. And it just so happened, for example, that China, which was a um, very advanced society economically and technologically, way in advance of, of Europe in 1600 or even 1700, it just so happened that under the uh, Qing um, and even even earlier on, on, on under the Ming, but especially under the Qing after 1644, uh, was very conservative, very hostile to innovation. There's a famous um, event in the 1790s. The English king, George III, sends scores of boxes of machinery to the Chinese emperor as a gift, telescopes and steam engines and so on. And the emperor, or at least the emperor's man, replies to the king of England, thank you very much, but we're in no need of gadgets. Well, this then brings me back to my question, which is, does it matter who in the society is respectful or if everyone is? Because so there's the date that looms large throughout these books, which is 1848. Yeah. Um, and and that's when you date the beginning of the the cultured classes, the the intellectuals, the clerisy, the clerisy, disdaining innovation and merchants mm -hmm. and capitalism. But but we have, I mean, between eighteen forty eight and now, there's been an awful lot of yeah. economic growth. Well, yeah, that's right. And so, why did I write the books? Because I'm terrified that the clerisy's position, Bernie Sanders, is a is a nice example. But so on and the other his side, fans. You're saying, and, and the professors and people who are fans and of the him. professors and and the the intellectuals on the left, but indeed also um, Donald Trump and that kind of person on the right, if he's really on the right, that the, they're very dangerous. But by now, ordinary people have bought into what I call the bourgeois deal. You let me, a uh, 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 bourgeois, um, innovate and start a new factory. Um, and in the long run, I'll make you rich. That's the deal. It, uh, we were um, – uh, Art Cardin and I are going to write or have written and are going to um, soon publish a, a popular version of the three three of volumes, which we're going to call Let Me Do It and I'll Make You Rich, The Bourgeois Deal. And that's what happened. Um, and that's what's protected us since 1848 against these terrible ideas, nationalism, Socialism, both ideas in the minds of intellectuals, journalists, think tanks, and then if you, if you like those two, nationalism, socialism, maybe you like national socialism, uh, the, uh, Nazism. So that's why I wrote the books is to hold back this tide of um, – Left and right utopianism. Do you think that you talk about uh, I mean, growth, as you said, the great enrichment and the rates of growth? Yeah. John Cochran, John, John, uh, John H. Cochran, who's Stanford and today's Wall Street Journal actually uh, wrote about because the GDP growth rate came out for 2016. It's 0.5 percent. Yeah, that's nice. So he said from 1950 to 2000, this is quoting John H. Cochran, the U.S. economy grew at an average rate of 3.5 percent annually. Since 2000, it has grown at half that rate, 1.76 percent. Mm -hmm. Even in the years since the bottom of the Great Recession in 2009, which should have been a time of fast catch-up growth, the economy has only grown at 2 percent. Is this 
some people will read this and be like, well, I mean growth. OK. What's, what's the big – we're all pretty rich. Why is growth so important? Is, are these differences in numbers scary? And so does this kind of thing scary? Do you think that these no. that we're, we're starting to paralyze the growth no. through some methods? Well, I you can kill it. You can paralyze growth. Um, Europe in the common market has done an excellent job of this with absurd regulations. The new Treaty of Rome, this is the central question in the vote in Britain in June about whether or not to stay in the common market. Um, the Treaty of Rome created a big f free trade area, which was a very good idea. But then Brussels has decided to Protection. level the playing field, as they keep saying. Mercantilize it, basically. They, that's mer mercantilizing. They're going to they're they're going to protect. Turns out that they end up they end up protecting France and Germany. Surprise, surprise. But okay. Um, no, I, I think that this um, sky is falling rhetoric that you hear these days from from e, even Cochran. I'm very surprised, but from Bob Gordon and and uh, even um, uh, uh, Tyler Cohen, who I wouldn't have expected it from, is premature. I think that. We mismeasure growth. We don't include enough of the changes in quality. We can't me measure them very well. When was the last time you changed an automobile tire? Uh, a very long time ago. Uh, things have improved and the consumer price index that you use to get real growth um, doesn't adequately – allow for this improvement quality. But what's more important is that the rest of the world, China and India in particular, are growing like mad because they're liberalizing. They're not in the Chinese case in politics but they're moving in the, against mercantilism and towards free trade inside and outside. And that is going to spread through the demonstration effect if nothing else. It will become more and more obvious that the way forward is liberalism and that will uh, make the rest of the world, which as I said is about $33 a day, which by the way was the American income in 1940. Uh, the, the, so the, we average, were, we the average income in the United States was $33 a head in 1940. Now it's $130 a head per day. Uh, so it's, there's been, as Cochran points out, a, a, a big improvement since then. So I think it's way premature to say that the end is near. Um, there was a cartoon in the New Yorker long, not too long ago which sh showed a bearded man walking away down the street with a s sign he held, the end is near, and this this couple who had seen him one says to the other, you know, that was Paul Krugman. <laughs> so we at the Cato Institute, our mission is to promote the very ideas that you are promoting, to spread the, the notion that this – that trade and innovation and capitalism and markets – Free societies. Are, free sure. societies are the ways to – Improve the state of humanity while yep. respecting people's dignity. Sure. Um, but I, I saw a poll just a few days ago that was asking supporters of various political candidates about yeah. their views on free trade. Yeah, yeah. Um, and first, the, the the overall numbers of people who thought that free trade was overall good were were low, which free is stressing. Trade. Yes, um, but but what was really striking was that. Every single one of the Republican candidates, mm -hmm. supporters polled lower on this than the Democratic yeah, isn't that, candidates. Isn't that shocking? Um, and, and so we've been – I mean we're used to having this – to to promoting the ideas to the, the clarity. We're used to this argument of no, look, it's you – know, you, you've misunderstood markets. Yeah. Socialism doesn't work for these yeah. reasons. We can show you the historical stuff. But how do we – tell this story, sell this bourgeois deal of let me get rich right now yeah. and over time I'll make you rich to 
the people on the opposite end from the clerisy, the, the ones who are, say, supporting Trump now who are saying, yeah, that sounds like a fine deal except I don't have the time. Like yeah. my family, yeah, you know, right. I can't find work. My kids well, can't find work. I'm hurting right now and what you're saying is, hey, I'm going to get rich and then I promise in yeah, a yeah. generation or two it's going to pay off. Yeah. Well, it, it in fact pays off much quicker than that. But what people need to understand and they don't is that, is that international trade has very little to do one way or the other with American prosperity. American prosperity. This is a very big country and most of the lost jobs in Pittsburgh or in Detroit were lost to other Americans, not to a bunch of Mexicans and Canadians and Japanese and so forth. So, so foreign trade, foreign trade, foreign free trade, I, I approve of it. They'll t take back my economist card if I don't. But, but what, I, what is really important is internal free trade and it's internal free trade to go to your, your point that's being leaned on with excessive regulation um, and, and foolish taxation such as the corporate income tax. So I am um, – how to persuade them? Uh, one way is to get more radical in some ways in the liberal. I want to stop calling myself a li libertarian. I'm a Christian – Li, li, Christian libertarian, but I'm going to start calling myself a, a Christian liberal. And what we should be saying is, look, the purpose of the Cato Institute is to make poor people rich. That should be its purpose. And that is its purpose because its program does make poor people rich. And if we were to say things like, uh, let's have a, a, a negative income tax, of a serious sort where the poor are raised up not by the very foolish minimum wage which is orthodoxy in the, in the Democratic Party but by giving people money if we don't like the, the poverty that they have. Um, if we were to say that, we would be able to sidestep the absurd claim that Cato or the libertarians are in favor of business and, and the Democrats are in favor of workers. Donald Trump is, of course, not really a conservative or a Republican. He's a populist. But that's his claim. He's going to help the workers by closing down trade all kinds of trade, and this is a terrible, terrible mistake. So I think we've got to develop a positive program for laissez-faire. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.